What's shaking, everyone? Last night, there was a town hall question and answer session that ABC put on, and a bunch of a bunches being generous, but a few likely voters were in the crowd, and they had their pre-scripted questions, and for the most part, things went off without a hitch, and considering George Snuffleupagus was the other moderator, moderator, host, whatever you want to call him for the event, hey, things... I watched it. My opinion is I think everything went fairly smoothly. You know, it was a lot better than what I expected. They hit on the major points like coronavirus and racial unrest, police violence, and, you know, the lot. But I've got the raw data from the... Well, it's the transcript of exactly what happened last night. We'll go through... Question... All the major important parts and then i'll show you what the mainstream media is currently spurging out about but before we dig too deep into that if you guys appreciate these videos that i do and you like my opinion feel free to hit that subscribe button and also if you don't mind just dropping a like it does me a ton of good and it is of no cost to you and that is definitely the best way to support me because that gets my content up out and into the ether and hey i'll be able to make more exciting videos in the future because let's be totally fair if you guys don't have to watch this town hall don't bother it's not nothing's gonna come out of it it was ah, it was just a quest question and answer session that i think everybody came off looking pretty good out of it to be completely honest but let's just dive right in so the first question that trump was asked was of course about coronavirus and let's just, it was uh, some portly little gentleman from Pennsylvania. This was held in, I believe, the Pittsburgh area, Philadelphia suburb. It was definitely in Pennsylvania, for sure. The first question was, it was phrased very weird. I'll just read you exactly what, uh, I don't know, Peter Griffin's shorter stand-in said. So... He was very concerned. I'm a conservative, pro-life diabetic. I also voted for President Trump in 2016. It was imperative that ABC started this off with a pro-Trump question. So I'm a conservative, pro-life, and diabetic. I've had to dodge people who don't care about social distancing and face masks. Obviously a paranoid asshole. I thought you were doing a good job with the, corona, with the pandemic response until about May 1st. What happened on May 1st? Then you took your foot off the gas pedal. Good analysis, pal. Why do you throw vul vulnerable people like me under the bus? Okay, that question leaves a lot to be desired. and We're going to find that by going through this transcript here. It was a lot of hyperbolic questions and a bunch of real goofy facts. But we'll leave it at that. Why does... um? You know, this little goof think that the president threw him under the bus because he's a paranoid diabetic who's, yeah. Well, to be fair, he'd probably have two comorbidities, but let's take a look. Well, Trump said, yeah, didn't really, Paul. We've worked very hard on the pandemic. We've worked very hard. It came from China, and they should never have let it happen. Tend to agree, because they knew a lot. And they hid quite a bit of it. I don't want you to forget that. They knew about the threat of the coronavirus in... Well, they held information that they received from Taiwan that it was in fact transmittable from person to person for at least three weeks. So um, that caused a lot of people to die. And if you look at what we've done, this is more what Trump says. And if you look at what we've done with ventilators, and now frankly with vaccines, we are very close to having a vaccine, which is true, The even according to Fauci, the left's favorite human being, uh, within four to six weeks, and the Pfizer and all the big, phar big pharma companies are working on it. As much as I don't like to trust big pharma, they do know what they're doing when it comes to medical research. If you want to know the truth, the pr 
Previous administration would have taken years to come up with a vaccine because of the FDA and all the approvals, and we're within weeks of getting it. You know, and then he goes on to list all of the big pharma companies that are currently working on it. Yeah, and goes through a bunch of other yeah you know, meaningless shit. And then the just the bulk of this is. Well, we had, nobody had to go without a ventilator that required a ventilator, even though I've heard conflicting reports. You take this with a grain of salt, that ventilators are actually, if you don't 100% require them, if you are placed on one, your body starts to go into some kind of reliance on the ventilator and you are more susceptible to passing away from coronavirus. That is something that I heard. It was a few months ago, and I couldn't find any corroborating evidence. But if anybody else has, you know, has heard something similar, can link it down in the comment section. That'd be great. I wouldn't mind going back over that as well. So one other big point that came up here in this question specifically. Yeah. When you see our testing, this is what Trump said. We are going to be at about 84 million tests. 84 million. Think of that. Great, Trump. And next would be about India with 50 million less testing. I, okay, 84 million tests in a country of 360 million as opposed to 34 million in a country of over a billion. So that's when eventually they get into the, you know, oh, there's been so many people dying in the United States. And uh, George Snuffleup, I guess, has his... His stats where it's, oh, we're doing so bad, the United States is, in deaths. And what Trump brings up is in relation to excess deaths, what that means is deaths that are expected throughout a calendar year, how many are above that? And when you look into the yeah, you place the United States, they are doing exceptionally well in comparison to other countries. But I don't like making those like raw data or even... You could rely a little bit more on percentages, but the fact of the matter is the United States is a very unique situation because it is such a large, well, a large land mass as well as a large population base what's the other, what's a comparable there really is no other comparable country that you can look at these raw statistics to and make a fair comparison to like in Canada everything is so spread out much like the United States and if you were to look at the raw death statistics you'd also have to factor in that in Canada 80% of coronavirus deaths came out of nursing homes. That's all on Justin Trudeau, Doug Ford, and everybody else throwing the sick. And listen, I can't speak French Canadian, so I can't say the name of the Quebec, pre or Quebec premier, so don't press me on it, but it's those guys' fault, okay? And the reason why, in the States, I think it's around... Oh geez, uh, forty to sixty percent are uh, nursing home deaths as well, and you can thank Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. You can thank Andrew Cuomo in New York. Uh, I'm blanking on the name for the New Jersey governor, but those are three cases. Those are three Democrat Democratic governors that sent sick people, sick young people, into nursing homes. And ended up with insane mortality because of it. Hence why there was such a big boom. Because there's been, if you look at the waves. Like there was the big curve. And then there was another little bump curve. When you're looking at cases and deaths. And that first big curve for cases and deaths were mostly due to the elderly. So, for being completely fair, yeah, um, the Democrats do have a lot of blood on their hands. So, that was the gist of the first question there, and then what we got after that. 
uh, you know, Stephanopoulos and Trump went back and forth describing what I had just laid out. And another thing, this is the gist. There were, I think, a dozen questions, and about a quarter of them were to do with coronavirus. And the common complaint was, oh, you didn't do more. You should have done more. You didn't do enough. Even the left well, not even the left, just the mainstream narrative is Trump really bungled this. I have never heard, I haven't heard anything that Trump could have coherently done above what he did. He shut down travel earlier than anybody else. Meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi, the highest ranking sitting Democrat, was out in Chinatown Proclaiming that everybody should come down and it should be, you should be creating terrorism. Tourism, not terrorism. She's an advocate for terrorism, but in this instance, she was advocating tourism. And Joe Biden was saying that placing travel restrictions on China when the information was still being held captive from Taiwan, that it was transmittable from person to person. He said, Joe Biden, this is, said that it was a xenophobic thing to do. Well, who knows if travel was still unfettered in the early stages, how much worse the infection rates and death rates could have been when we didn't have any idea of the potency of hydroxychloroquine or even just dealing with it how we are now. So, I'll just jump to the my conclusion on the coronavirus point. I don't know what Trump could have done better. There's another question that was in here as well about a national mask mandate. Do you really want your legislators, your elected officials that are supposed to be working for you, telling you what you have to do? What you have to wear? On technology that is sketchy at best for dealing with coronavirus. Trump also, when he was asked about that national mask mandate and why he doesn't support it, he's very clear in the fact that, well, some people don't like and are uncomfortable with masks. Some people automatically get an exemption if they are asthmatic or have any other kind of breathing problem, which is Probably detrimental detrimental to them considering the fact that this is a respiratory disease and does affect you quite a bit if you are infected by any such disease, but I digress. But I want you to think it brings up Trump brings up the analogy of a waiter who comes over to you and fiddling with his mask so you can properly hear him or constantly touching his face, which is something that we were told and I remember being told in kindergarten, stop touching your face, clean your hands, wash your hands, and stop touching your face. And that's supposed to be the first line of defense back when we were told that masks were not necessary. Remember that, folks? Yeah, we weren't supposed to wear masks. That's what Fauci told us. Everybody's favorite doctor, right? The man who knows everything, right? Yeah, exactly. So there is an argument to be made that maybe masks and you look at the different Fabric masks, two-ply masks, N95 masks, Vader masks, goalie masks, their level of effectiveness. I'm just going to go on a little bit of a sidebar here, too. I've already done it several times, so why not add to the pile? Uh, With all of the wildfires, they were... They, the intelligentsia out there, were recommending that you don't wear a mask... To protect yourself from smoke. Because it won't be effective. Now you're telling me that a coronavirus mask is supposed to protect you and others by trapping in virus particles that are much smaller than smoke particles. But at the same time, the masks aren't going to prevent much larger smoke particles from coming into your body. Got to press X to doubt on that one, guys. Now this coronavirus segment has gone on much too long, so we're going to go down and jump to a question about the ongoing unrest, to put it nicely.
all the Black Lives Matter protests and riots. So one of the first questions that Trump got about the riots and unrest was from Laura Galvis, a, a nurse from Glenshaw, Pennsylvania. I'm sure it's a suburb of Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. Or <laughs> Pennsylvania, that's the state they're in, fuck. The Philadelphia, mind shit the bed. Thinking about that Biden town hall that's going to be on Thursday. Oh boy, there's going to be a recap on that one too. Hopefully it's just as fair and balanced and... Uh, I wouldn't hold my breath, though. So Laura evokes MLK when he said, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In the light of ongoing protests surrounding the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the shooting of Jacob Blake, do you feel race, racial injustices are incurring in this nation? And if so, what can be done to address them? And this really opened up to what Trump was pushing very hard. What he has been pushing very hard is supporting law and order, supporting the police officers and the frontline workers therein. Now, everybody's well apprised of Trump being very pro law and order, very pro armed forces. He was, every question that was some derivative of this was always give the police back their dignity, respect the authority. Allow the police to do their job because overwhelming majority, 99% of police officers are great. And just like in every single job, I'm sure everybody has worked with a really shitty employee who will dodge work or just go out of their way to avoid doing work in order to just collect a paycheck. And that also happens in the police as well. And unfortunately, it Unfortunate as it is to say, it's more important to train police and ask them to do better and do that with support than it is to kneecap them because you end up with a failed state I can't think of anywhere quicker. So one of the last big talking points, I'm going to get to one question that really sticks out in my head. So there was a pastor from Philly that came up and was a very combative. And I'm just going to go ahead and read this exchange back to front. His name was Carl Day, so I'll just refer to him as Day for ease of reading and ease of understanding. So Day said, Day opened up with, you've coined the phase, make America great again. Trump, right. Day, when has America been great for America, African Americans in the ghetto of America? Are you aware of, the tone de of how tone deaf that comes off for the African American community? What does he mean? Is he one of these people that constantly thinks that just because he's black, he's not a part of this country and that he, this guy came across as having a very strong victim mentality. All of these questions are cut up on ABC's YouTube channel. If you'd like to go back and watch them, you can do so from there. So Trump replied to the pastor here. Well, I can say we have tremendous African-American support. We've probably seen it in the polls, and we're doing extremely well with African Americans, Hispanic Americans, at levels you've rarely seen a Republican have. Uh, nearly 40% for African Americans in the Hispanic levels. I haven't seen them lately, but they're of similar levels, which definitely for Republicans is uh, several fold above the norm. Now, if you talk about Make America Great, if you just look just prior to, I'm in the... I'm talking about the black community. I'm reading like Trump. Uh, you look just prior to this horrible situation coming in from China. When this virus came in, that was probably the highest point. Home ownership for the black community. Home ownership, lower crime, the best jobs they've ever had, the highest income, the best employment numbers they've ever had. All of those facts are true. If you go back and you want to look over many years, you could just go back six or seven months from now. That was the best single moment in the history of African American people in this country, I think I would say. Based on the metrics that he is laying out, it is hard to argue against that. If you want to dive into the social causes and when it's been better for African Americans, I'd. it wasn't brought up in the debates, but I'd also like to bring up the 1950s when black families were... Once again, a two-part or two-parent household, and the data is fairly conclusive on having two strong, 
parents in the household creates for better, well-behaved children with a lower propensity for committing crime and ending up in jail. I know I'm simplifying the study, but in the 50s, of wed black families were at the all-time high. And then you bring in things like welfare and incentivized single motherhood. Then that lays the path for the destruction of not just black Americans, but for anybody else who wants to become dependent on the system. So again, this guy continues on with his victimhood mentality. Yeah, your statement though, make it great again. So historically, the African American experience, especially in these, out of these ghettos, that have been redlined historically, these ghettos that have systematically been set up, been treated the way that they have been, the conditions of the drugs, the guns, what does the president have to do with drugs and guns in these neighborhoods? Uh, they get there regardless. Um, illegal guns and illegal drugs are just that, illegal. But um, criminals have this weird way of continuing to get the contraband regardless. And everything else that actually created the symptoms for what we see that you profess to be just in democratic cities themselves. These things have historically been happening for African Americans in these ghettos. Well, where are the largest ghettos? New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston. Have I mentioned any Republican cities at the moment? Houston has been, but it has since flipped. So I don't know what to tell you. It seems to be um, endemic of um, a certain ideology coming in, creating dependence and not fostering any sort of upward mobility. So Trump re eventually replied to this um, meandering retort. So if you go, well, and then Day closed this question with, and I mean, you've said everything else about choking and everything else in what Trump was mentioning in regards to... Uh, Police sometimes under pressure, choking, making the wrong decision, and everything else. And you have yet to address and acknowledge that there's been a race problem in America. Just automatically assuming that everything's racist and everything's sexist and you need to call it out. If you get that reference, you're one of my people. So if you go, well, this is what Trump said. I hope that there's not a race, po not a race problem, I can tell you. That there's none with me because I have respect for all races, for everybody. This country is great because of it. Exactly. That's not this diversity is our greatest strength. It's respecting respectable people. And that's what we should all strive for. When you go back six months and you take a look at what was happening, you can't even compare with the past administrations. When you look at income levels and a lot of other things, because of the job situation, when they had the lowest income, the best employment numbers they've ever had, the black community by far. And that is solving a lot of problems. And you know what else? It was bringing people together. It was starting to get just before this was we were having a lot of, we were having a long run of success. I was starting to get calls from Democrats that, hey, it's starting to work. Let's get together. People that you would never have thought this would have happened with. There was going to be unity, but unfortunately this was heard because we got set back. But now, I think next year is going to be one of our best years economically. I don't see why not, based on all the numbers that are coming out, not just exclusively the Wall Street numbers, but employment. The fact is, at this point in their recovery model for unemployment numbers um 12 to 15 percent was still supposed to be an optimistic outlook and the most recent numbers are 8.8 .8. now granted i will give you that some of those jobs lost and then regained went from full-time to part-time but these are people that are allowed to work and are getting after it and the fact that they are what, four, five, six points above projections? Fucking A. Take the win. So, a link to the rest of this. It's a horrifically boring two hours. I did it for you guys, so you don't have to watch this. But all in all, it did come off good. 
for being a former Clinton communications director and a political advisor for parts of well, Bubba Clinton's two terms and being a oh left-wing partisan hack who's donated $75,000 to the Clinton campaign. I mean, Strombol or Strombolopoulos. That's another terrible journalist hack. Uh, Stephanopoulos did a, you know, as good of a job as I could have hoped for. He was, if you guys have seen the most recent Chris Wallace interview, the one where he was pressed, one where Trump was pressed to provide numbers, and the famous quote coming out of it was, "Let's go, come on, come on, to get the numbers to it." to an aid off screen, it was about that same tone and tenor. Like if you have a jaded outlook from any sort of headlines that you might have come across today, in my opinion, it was decent. But I didn't bother looking at any of the review pieces that came out after this town hall was held. Because maybe it was because I knew it was gonna be shit. Maybe I knew it was gonna be jaded. But I could not believe just how ridiculous it is. Like, okay, this is just a simple Google search for Trump Town Hall. Now we'll go through the first Google page here. So, yeah, top stories. All three from CNN. Hmm. Press X to doubt. That seems a little suspect. Fact, fact check. Trump made at least 22 false or misleading claims at ABC Town Hall. Trump fumbles through tough encounter with undecided voters. Trump's town hall didn't go well. And let's just see if there's anything else. Oh yes, CBC, uh, my local propaganda outlet that's funded by the Canadian government and completely holds water for anything red or orange that's liberal and new democrat, which is left and far left. Washington Post, opinion. Trump's disastrous town hall should... Yeah, shows he should never, let's see, have brought up mental acuity, <laughs> mental acuity in his disastrous town hall. As you can see, fair and balanced by our lovely media. Dude, it didn't go poorly. Okay, and the point that the stupid CBC said, yeah. One final parting thing. There was the two main conspiracies, the big leftist conspiracies right now. That Donald Trump called fallen soldiers suckers and losers. And that was ran and originally presented prior to President Trump rebuking those claims as just absolute fact. And also, yeah, that he continued to downplay. One of the things that you'll find in the transcript there was that Trump said, you know what? With my verbiage, I downplayed it, but I actually uplayed it in my actions by instituting all of the different policies that I listed earlier in the video. And another big thing is he evoked Winston Churchill when he was describing this play, downplaying thing. Fuck off already. He was saying that, okay, was Winston Churchill downplaying the bombings that were happening in World War II by going to the top of the building? Was he being dishonest by saying everybody's going to be alright and we're going to take care of this? No, he was giving people hope. He knew he had the backing of his allied forces and he was doing the right thing for his people. Was he being dishonest about the current situation? Perhaps. But he was being a great leader at the same time. And that's what Trump said. And I think that's fair in this situation. If you run around telling people to worry about the end of days, they're going to act even worse in that proclamation. But if you tell them, hey, we've got your back, we got a vaccine coming, we're taking all the necessary precautions that we possibly can, and we're listening to experts, meanwhile, things behind the scenes fluctuate from day to day. I think he's done a great job on coronavirus because... I haven't heard anything to the contrary. And one final point, outside of the wild conspiracy theories that the left are just allowed to run with, but as soon as you mention, like, I'm not a supporter of that QAnon shit. I don't know enough about it, nor do I care to, because it all just seems a little bit too suspect to be 
anything really, but hey, if there's evidence to the contrary, by all means. People who criticize President Trump and his administration for not doing enough in regards to the riots, in regards to the coronavirus response, need to understand the difference between the powers of the state and the federal government. The federal government looks after national security and national events. You can argue that the coronavirus is a national emergency that the president should exclusively be taken care of, but there's this pesky thing called states' rights where governors have ultimate control over the cities and towns and counties that are under their jurisdiction. And the president just has to deal with interstate issues. All of the big complaints that are levied against Trump tend to stem from that misunderstanding, not knowing the difference between states' rights and what the federal government is capable of. He also mentioned that when the riots were at their peak, that uh, the Insurrection Act could have been called. No. A very... A much more diplomatic way of doing things is presenting these governors with all of the available resources to them, the National Guard, to clear everything out, extra funding, and any kind of support that they need. But when you have Jay Inslee in Washington, or Kate Brown in Oregon, or Andrew Cuomo in New York, flat out not accepting it and bad-mouthing Trump in the process by calling him a tyrant and all that bonky, bonkers horseshit that Ted Wheeler's been on about, who's um, magically gone quiet after he tucked tail and ran out of his burning building, but I digress anyways. The states and the cities need to look after the states and the cities. The president and his administration are looking after the country. He can't overstep his bounds. It's like if you have an entry-level job, you have a manager that you report to, and that manager has a manager that they report to. Now, ultimately, if that regional manager comes in for the day and he starts telling you what to do, you have an obligation to follow what your manager tells you to do on a daily basis because that guy doesn't know how things are run at your individual location your regional manager is going to understand how things are supposed to run and are be supposed to be profitable for the entire region and have a general understanding of what happens at a store or single location so you have to defer to the people that are there on a daily basis and that would solve a lot of problems and clear up a bunch of foggy rhetoric that surrounds Trump and his administration. But that's the gist of this town hall. I'm going to come back on Thursday when Joe Biden has his held on CNN by Anderson Cooper. I expect it to be a two-hour hand-holding session that will be full of jump cuts because this was recorded and then aired. This was not live. And I think that was done out of fairness to both Trump and to Biden. Because Biden's not doing anything that's not being edited and not being pre-taped. You fucking bet your bottom dollar on that one, guys. Anyways, this video's gone on long enough. And thanks for sticking around. And hopefully you got some good information out of this. Because... It's two hours. You can go watch the cut-up clips, all the clips together. You can get some of the highlights on the ABC YouTube channel as well. I don't know. Let's just march on towards those debates. Two short weeks away. It's going to be fun. Anyways, guys, I'll end it there. I've been Don Consuelo. I want you guys to follow your gut and get after it. Take care, everyone.